you know, I didn't want to do an episode about Martin Scorsese saying that he doesn't consider the quote-unquote Marvel movies to be movies, because one, I don't think it's an interesting or newsworthy story, really. Two, literally everything about the whole scenario is stupid and depressing to me as a fan of pretty much everything involved. And three, again, 76-year-old man is not the biggest fan of one particular type of movie, is not a news story, even when it is one of the world's greatest living filmmakers. I mean, are we really still doing appeal to authority for things like this in 2019? Look, I'm a doughy white guy film nerd who was born in the 80s, so I'm basically required to worship Martin Scorsese, but guys, come on, Martin Scorsese also thought Exorcist 2 was better than the first one. I mean, that doesn't prove anything either, but have you seen Exorcist 2 lately? I was possessed by a demon. He's gone. I mean, not everyone who's a great filmmaker or works in film is necessarily the last word on these things. When people ask Paul Thomas Anderson if he made Punch Drunk Love with Adam Sandler to be meta, he very matter-of-factly explained, no, I really like Adam Sandler movies and I wanted to work with him, which, you know, if you look into Anderson's work and life outside filmmaking, honestly makes a lot of sense. He seems like a really down-to-earth, regular, relatable dude. Like, not every artist is an artiste, you know? Quentin Tarantino isn't big on Alfred Hitchcock, and even not Anthony Perkins was better in Psycho 2, which honestly is a better movie than it has any right to be, but that's another show. And speaking of Hitchcock, do you know what his favorite movie was in 1977. I know, you're expecting me to say Star Wars because that was the birth of the blockbusters and it makes a nice segue here, but no, it was actually Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, how about that? And people have opinions it's not worth fighting over just because they're famous is where I'd prefer to leave it, honestly, but now it's turned into a thing because people who like superhero movies got way too upset about this, people who hate that genre got way too self-righteous about it, and most obnoxiously of all, the subset of fandom that likes superhero movies but hates these ones in particular got the most self-righteous of all, as though the guy who started off by saying he doesn't even watch the damn things wasn't likely using Marvel movie generically like people do for Xerox machines or Band-Aids. Yeah, sure, I'm really certain that Martin Scorsese has no time for movies like Ant-Man and Doctor Strange, but is somehow just all all about Suicide Squad, and he's so pissed that Jared Leto wasn't in Birds of Prey. I mean, come on. But this became a thing, and then Francis Ford Coppola jumped in to kick it back up the news cycle, so fine, you win. We'll talk about it. You see? <laughs> I didn't wreck it, Sheriff. Okay, so as I said, I don't care that either of these two directors don't like movies that I happen to like for the most part because my identity and sense of self-worth isn't bound to the consumer products that I purchase in that way, and if yours is, please stop doing that. It's not good for you. But I also think that I don't really enjoy this particular type of thing as a perfectly valid media opinion, yes, even if you work in that media. Now, I'm a film critic, so I don't really have the professional option of not experiencing stuff that I don't generally like, but that's a separate issue from whether or not I can appraise it objectively as possible. Yeah, I think everyone should try and experience as much variety as they can, but it's not automatically innately bad to know that you dislike superhero movies or romantic comedies or horror films or black and white movies or films from a certain decade or whatever. But, and there is a but here, he didn't just leave it at personal dislike, Scorsese in this case. He also opined that in his view, these films aren't cinema, and I would agree that that's being unfairly dismissive. I also hasten to add that if any filmmaker living has earned the right to be a bit unfairly dismissive of anything, unlike Coppola, who's honestly just being kind of a hypocritical dick here, and we'll get back to that, it's the director of Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, The Last Waltz, Raging Bull, Last Temptation of Christ, Cape Fear, Casino, The Departed, Hugo and the Wolf of Wall Street, among others. But I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you. I make you laugh. I'm here to fucking amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? But do I think he's wrong on this point? Yeah, I do, and I don't think it's at all unreasonable, all by the way, for people who've directed some of the movies he's painting with this extremely broad brush like James Gunn to talk back about it, sure. I mean, has James Gunn made a movie as good as Goodfellas? No, no he hasn't, but, you know, he also hasn't made a movie as bad as Gangs of New York. The thing of it is, I get the sense that if this was taking the form of a dialogue instead of sound bites, which we now keep getting because I assume Netflix has decided that this is good marketing for the Irishman, it would still be just as obnoxious, but people who think they've found validation for their bold, rebellious stand of not enjoying popular thing would quickly find that it's a lot less about aesthetics and genre than it is about business. Because, not to get to inside baseball about this, when older professionals in the film industry say they've got an issue with this or that property they don't actually know much about but refer to in terms of not really movies and amusement park rides like Scorsese did, what they tend to be annoyed about is less the films themselves and more about distribution models and the discourse. At least in my experience. See, when industry people talk about too many superhero movies or before that too many blockbusters, too many action movies, whatever, in general, people like me are usually quick to point out that the numbers just don't back that up. At most, we're talking about maybe between 6 and 10 movies a year total, half of that if we really do only mean the Marvel stuff, but it does take up a lot of the cultural oxygen and a greater share of studio marketing budgets because it's generally what's making money right now and paying for all of the other stuff, plus the serialized cross-multimedia big-screen TV series format of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in particular that everyone else wants to chase actually is a major new thing that has completely changed how people interact with film going as a week-to-week, year-to-year experience that's very much outside what filmmakers in their 70s or older are used to, and it's not totally surprising they end up bracing against it. Sure, some of the transformation 
of theatrical movie going is sort of unavoidable, and people get bent out of shape for the wrong reasons or without taking a truly, well, if you'll pardon the branding big picture look at the issue by ignoring the impact of television and streaming, and that a large audience of adults with disposable income are more likely to stay home than go out. I mean, if you're wondering why it seems like there were a lot more mid-budget cop movies, lawyer movies, family dramas, serial killer movies even, or whatever in the 80s and 90s, it's because there weren't four different CSIs, Law and Orders, etc. to turn those ideas into episodes of instead, and you didn't have HBO, AMC, and whoever else turning every pretty good drama pitch into a 13-episode streaming series. And if you're an actor or a screenwriter, maybe this doesn't make as much of a difference, or it's even preferable case to case. But you've got to remember, guys, Scorsese and Coppola's age came up when there wasn't even such a thing as home video. So when they said they wanted to make films, they meant films, as in self-contained pieces for movie theaters. And even as an Embrace Technological Evolution guy, I can't not sympathize with at least Scorsese going out to studios with The Irishman, his reunion movie with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, plus Al Pacino. I'm gonna miss my hoo-ha, my tangoing, my blind driving, my hoo-ha. You said that already. I say it a lot. Hoo-ha! And having all the majors go, eh, you know, Marty, with the de-aging effects, that's kind of expensive, and it's gonna have to be long, and it's not really something we can franchise out and do a dozen other things and make back the money, so we're gonna pass. And he ends up taking it to Netflix, which will gladly make it, but then it's going to get pulled into the bullshit controversies of whether or not Netflix movies should be eligible for Oscars, and that's gonna be a discussion instead of the movie, so he'll be on a junket tour promoting that to answer those questions. Yeah, I get why he'd be a little salty. I'd probably be pissed too. It happens. Coppola jumping in is another story altogether, though. Legend or not, sure. Sure, but he hasn't had his name on a quality product that didn't come out of his vineyard in over two decades. He's mostly been retired for almost as long as a lot of the people in front of and behind the cameras on the Marvel movies have been working, and when he was, it's not like he was operating in all that different a mode. No, seriously, people forget this, but Coppola built his reputation on The Godfather, which was an adaptation of a contemporary popular novel that was considered huge, but not necessarily good? I mean, it wasn't thought of as bad, either, but it was regarded in its day as a potboiler, not a literary classic, a big, long, bloated airplane read of a thing, full of lurid tangents and over-the-top melodrama that was especially scandalous because everyone knew certain characters and events had been based on some people who were real and still alive. In other words, as source material goes, it was closer in pop culture perception to mass appeal lit phenomenons like The Da Vinci Code or James Patterson's 20 bestsellers a year, and Coppola figuring out how to successfully turn that material into genuine artistic triumph instead of the lurid soap opera that it more readily would have been made into is not all that dissimilar from the task facing everyone who steps up to direct one of the Marvel movies and tries to get something that resonates on a bigger, deeper level, even if it's based on assembly line serialized children's literature from the 70s. And besides that, Coppola and his whole film school generation clique of directors, particularly his close pals Lucas, Spielberg, De Palma, Milius, etc., all pretty much made their names, transforming the seemingly disposable and disreputable genre fair of their youth into big-budget modern Hollywood's cash cows. In other words, he, of all people, should know better, or at the very least, he could stand to be less vitriolically dismissive about something that's in very very many respects, the next logical evolution of his own legacy. At least, that's how I see it. <sighs> but you know what really irritates me about these sorts of reductionist takes and the way people glom onto them is that they end up obscuring important, meaningful dialogues about bigger issues behind specifics that people want to focus on for unrelated reasons. And I don't just mean Scorsese not really getting to talk about his concerns about the business of the film industry changing because all anyone wants to ask him about is Marvel now. In a way, this has always been kind of a second function of the Walt Disney Company as a pop culture institution going back to when it was primarily a movie studio. In reality, there wasn't that much difference different in terms of being an assembly line production house with contract stars and employees between Walt Disney and other Hollywood companies, but being one studio that ended up cornering the market for a good stretch on feature animation and safe family comedies aimed at middle-class white suburbanites allowed generations of people with the very common boring opinion of not liking certain genres or filmmaking styles to shorthand that as not liking Disney specifically, and suddenly it sounded like some focused, considered, thought-out, possibly righteous stance against a specific corporation. And now that same irritating transference happens with Marvel, Star Wars, and dozens of other things, where conversations we should be having about the homogenization of the blockbuster scene, the transformation of the industry, globalized distribution, vis-a-vis -vis workers' rights, everything involving the Chinese market, but the discourse over every one of those keeps getting hijacked by this or that subset of competing fandom or political subgroup or whatever to score cheap points for one side or the other. And it helps... well, it helps nobody, really. So, can we stop, maybe? Can we stop discussing these things like this? Anyway. I'm Bob, and this has been the 300th episode of The Big Picture.
Man, what amazing luck for Netflix, huh? One full year to when they spent all that money trying to win an Oscar only to lose to Viggo Mortensen solving racism by eating pizza in an amusing way because of that whole Netflix killing traditional cinema thing. The famously well-respected Hollywood legend they gave a shit ton of money to so he could make a movie practically DARPA engineered to win the Best Picture Oscar by total coincidence starts a huge media fracas about how, no, actually it was a different studio that killed cinema. Yep. Some kind of lucky. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just playing, Marty. I'm just playing. In all sincerity and seriousness, all kidding aside, whatever the genesis of the whole Martin Scorsese versus Marvel movies bullshit nonsense, it's all gone way too far. Even if he is leaning into it and constantly bringing it back up as well, when I feel like a lot of the film press would rather just let it go at this point, I know I would. Agree or not, that guy is one of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. If anyone is entitled to a contrarian take, it's him. And it both shouldn't and doesn't have any bearing on his new film, The Irishman, which is a major reunion between a great filmmaker, several of his greatest collaborators, his most famous genre, and a monumentally important work, no matter how you slice it, really no matter how it even is. So let's all chill out with the dumb media-generated feud, can the jokes, and review Martin Scorsese's latest landmark opus, The Irishman. I demand to know who is responsible for that. Wait, what? No, 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 you, you, you And so, at last, The Irishman. Unofficially, the long-awaited installment of the loose Scorsese and other legendary Italian guys recap boomer-centric 20th century history via first-person narration trilogy preceded by Goodfellas, but also the much broader Martin Scorsese toxic assholes who don't quite know we can see what they really look like in the moment disingenuously telling their life story for maximum irony oeuvre that also includes those films and The Wolf of Wall Street, Taxi Driver, and other movies that will presumably one day be remade almost beat for beat, yet somehow not the least bit understood by the director of Road Trip. This this time round, the maestro of morally murky mafia mayhem has as his subject the sprawling, which is film critic for extremely long, adaptation of I Heard You Paint Houses, a 2004 semi-speculative narrative fiction chronicle by Charles Brandt of Teamsters Union figurehead and organized crime figure Frank the Irishman Sheeran, who claimed at the time to know, among other things, the real story behind the assassinations of JFK, RFK, Jimmy Hoffa, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and myriad mafia connections between all of this and more, though his particular details are widely disputed and largely unprovable. Robert De Niro has the lead role as Sheeran, Joe Pesci returns from semi-retirement as his friend and handler Russell Buffalino, Pacino has the showy part as Hoffa, and a whole host of Scorsese regulars, wise guy specialists, and just guys you expect in lengthy period pieces about unpleasant men in unflattering haircuts and tacky suits doing crimes, like Javi Keitel, Ray Romano, Bobby Cannavale, and Jesse Plemons, all step forth to fill out the rest of the cast, almost all of whom transition from middle age to their twilight years in front of our eyes through the use of impressive CGI the aging technology, except for the ones who don't live all the way through the movie, obviously. And and unlike recent uses of such tech, the deployment in The Irishman, even though a near constant presence in the film itself, is so invisible you almost immediately forget you're watching a film covered in jaw-dropping CGI effects almost any time any of the main cast is on screen. Which in itself becomes kind of an ironic metaphor for how quietly powerful and deceptively excellent The Irishman gradually reveals itself to be, even while deliberately avoiding the kind of kinetic flourish one has come to expect from Scorsese in his grand sweeping crime saga mode. Make no mistake, all allusions to Casino and Goodfellas are unavoidable, but whereas those features the energetic stylization and rolling tide of history pace complemented the respective energies of their main perspectives in Goodfellas, even though we were allowed to see Henry Hill from the outside and know that he's a jackass for actually being nostalgic for how much fun he had as a low-life criminal. You know, all those tracking shots and classic rock songs put us into his headspace enough we kind of got it. The same way we knew Sam Rothstein in Casino was an ass when he started grousing about how Las Vegas had changed and the big corporations took it all over and now the place looks like Disneyland. Like, yeah, Sam, it sure does suck they got rid of all the murder and charming romantic rapes and 
and such, but Scorsese shows us the flair and the old time Rat Pack opulence that we kind of got it too. And those films felt authentic because they were made and acted largely by people from those eras now in different stages of adulthood and middle age, looking back on them with some self-awareness and also plenty of actual whimsy. What's vividly different about The Irishman and what makes it feel like something that only this filmmaker and these collaborators could have made at this point in their careers and lives is that this time the whimsy is gone. There's no romance this time around, no grand sweep, no joyful for a minute there we ruled the world idealism, no pining for something that could have been. This time, even though we're still not dealing with characters who themselves are terribly intellectual or introspective and Scorsese himself is wise enough to not try and pretend otherwise, which is what everyone else who tries to do this kind of material tends to mess up on, the view looking back is all self-awareness and the awareness is all disappointment and regret and shame. These aren't the exciting gangsters or the glamour gangsters, these are the guys for whom life of crime starts in middle age when they were already truck drivers and family men with car payments and mortgages and houses in the suburbs and pain in the ass wives whose ambitions were to put pools in and get better tires or a slightly nicer steak and decide whose street gets a stop sign. Yeah, people get shot and cars blow up still, but there's this whole pervading sense of smallness and pointlessness between the big stuff, watching them all get older and slower and worse haircuts, and terrible old white people outfits and having crime meetings over goddamn early bird specials, and you start realizing, do they have a reason to keep doing this shit other than to not think about how long they've been doing this shit? The central thrust of the plot comes to concern Sharon's growing sense of divided loyalty between his respective surrogate father figures and teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa, who likes him and helps him become a local union figure in his own right, and the mob leaders who at first back Hoffa's political ambitions and act as his shadow enforcers, but turn against him amid the complicated three-way feud with the Kennedy brothers. Oh, um, yeah, for what it's worth, in Sharon's version of history, where he also claims to have played a role in the Bay of Pigs lead up, he supports the Kennedy Hoffa conspiracy theory that Joseph Kennedy Sr. used mafia connections to get JFK elected so that he'd help leverage mob affiliated union business interests in Latin America, that the mob then turned on the Kennedys and killed John when Bobby became AG and targeted Hoffa instead, and that Hoffa was then killed because he knew about this and wasn't ceding enough control of the union to the mob, so yeah. I I don't know about that. Uh, Sharon also claimed in the book he was responsible for Joe Biden's political career, which is not in the movie, which is interesting. Look, the stuff doesn't have to have happened for the movie to be good, okay? In any case, Hoffa kind of ends up being the most interesting character and really the heart of the movie, though Pesci is by far the most enigmatic and surprising. It's kind of genius to call back a famous firebrand actor into service to play what might be his most quiet, underplayed, reserved role ever. It's Pacino as a famously theatrical demagogue, so of course Hoffa is the showy part but narratively, the Irishman frames him as the X factor no one else sees coming to upset the order of things. As rendered by the film, this particular level of organized crime runs on an implicit understanding that everyone is just a working schlub hustling for a buck and therefore has no principles and can't be sold or bought out at some point. So the idea that even though Hoffa is thoroughly corrupt as everyone else, he actually has a handful of actual core principles, personal, contradictory, random, and idiosyncratic though they may be, it's enough to throw the whole system completely out of whack so he needs to be taken care of. The Irishman is a hell of a movie. It's also a hell of a long movie. In fact, thanks to the Netflix backing, this may indeed be the best movie your great uncle watches in 20 minute increments right before bed over the course of two months this year. And while I don't know if it's my favorite film of 2019, it's going to be hard to imagine anything else as a best picture frontrunner right now. And if the tides of history have indeed moved to the point where this were indeed the last time a film comprised almost entirely of old white men having vaguely ominous conversations about whether that thing was handled for the guy in a succession of mid-priced restaurants, well, I give it 8 out of 10. It's a good one for the genre to go out on. So apparently a couple people didn't like that I opened my very positive, I'll remind you, review of The Irishman with a joke about Director Martin Scorsese's weird ongoing media feud with the so-called Marvel Cinematic Universe.
no, the other joke about Martin Scorsese's weird ongoing media feud with the so-called Marvel Cinematic Universe. What amazing luck for Netflix, huh? One full year to when they spent all that money trying to win an Oscar only to lose to Viggo Mortensen solving racism by eating pizza in an amusing way because of that whole Netflix killing traditional cinema thing, the famously well-respected Hollywood legend they gave a shit ton of money to so he could make a movie practically DARPA engineered to win the Best Picture Oscar by total coincidence starts a huge media fracas about how no, actually it was a different studio that killed cinema. Yep, some kinda lucky. Yeah, that's the one. Now, obviously, I'm having a bit of fun at what I hope most people understand is something I view as a frivolous, somewhat irritating distraction. The main reason this is being treated like any kind of big deal is precisely because the unwritten code of showbiz conduct holds that people generally don't go after one another's productions in public under their own names, and especially not older professionals, in regards to the work of mostly younger ones, because even if you're too much of a legend to care, you don't want to give the industry any more reason than it already has to resist hiring or engaging with people over 35. The fact is, even though it has been good for ratings, as far as my ridiculous industry is concerned, I would really rather this whole dumb excuse for a controversy went away yesterday because the discourse around it became shallower and more pointless than any superhero movie almost immediately, and seeing many of my respective peers and one of our great living directors, well, in my estimation, kind of making fools of themselves, even though they're doing their arguing with other creatives and critics at the same time, that both are fending off truly unhinged commentary from some of the actual dumbest people in the fanboy community is, well, tiring and disheartening. But if Scorsese isn't going to stop doubling and tripling down on this and people who should know better are going to keep writing think pieces in response, well, I guess I've got at least one more brain dropping to push out too. And also, I've got an electrician scheduled to be here in like a few hours, so I need a topic I can put together an episode for really quickly. So, if you're just joining us on this one, it's stupid and I'm sorry, but what's going on is that director Martin Scorsese, as part of making a bigger point about the lessening of theatrical distribution opportunities for different types of films, used as his example the overwhelming theatrical presence of quote-unquote Marvel movies, which he likened to being more akin to theme park rides and movies and therefore not cinema, a little earlier in the month while out promoting The Irishman. This in turn made fanboys very, very angry, not a big surprise, got a few directors who'd worked on Marvel films themselves mildly offended enough to defend their work, a bit more surprising that was, and finally gave other not regularly employed older directors and film critics of more, at least in their own minds, discerning taste the license they'd apparently been waiting on to speak out that they too had had just about enough of having to pretend to take the presence of Captain America and company at all seriously three or four times a year. So, after the discourse of this had melted down the internet for like a week or two, someone managed to corner Scorsese again and essentially ask him, hey, do you maybe want to take another shot at this one? So we got this. Let's say the family wants to go to an amusement park. That's a good thing, you know? And at the amusement park, there's these cinematic expressions. They're new art form. It's something different from films that are shown normally in theaters. Enjoyable? Fine, go and it's an event. And it's great to go to an event like an amusement park, but don't crowd out. Greta uh, uh, Gerwig, and don't crowd, crowd out Paul Thomas Anderson and Noah Baumbach and those people. Just don't, in terms of theaters. Okay, so when I first saw this whole thing breaking out, my immediate thought was, well, this seems to me like there are two thoughts getting mashed together as one thought in the timing, i.e. he's clearly mostly irritated that the deliberately paced adult drama has been market priced out of theaters and onto television and he prefers working on the big screen, and so that understandable frustration is being conflated with a neighboring but not necessarily connected issue of whether or not he thinks especially highly of the films that are currently seen as viable in theaters. Thing is, I had been giving the benefit of the doubt that the point-blurring conflation was coming from the reporting, but it seems more like it was coming from Scorsese himself. And that's a bummer, because the main part of what he's talking about is really important, really needs to be talked about more, is really complicated and thorny and bound up in a whole host of modern societal stuff and demands a lot of thoughtful discussion that he's exactly the kind of person who should be leading and championing, but then the secondary part is just... Not that. At all. The secondary part is just this sad, cringy mix of ugly, snobbery, generational disconnect and dismissal that's honestly really unbecoming of an artist of his caliber otherwise, and more substantively, undermines the crap out of what at least seemed to be his main point. See, the thing is, you can put a lot of the state of theatrical distribution being what it is on the Disney Company's pseudo-monopoly, given that they practice chain releasing and block booking in order to crowd other studios out of the physical theater space, they're buying up intellectual property like it's going out of style, etc. 
so on and so forth, but Scorsese is making an argument beyond market economics here, that essentially filmmakers and film studios have a certain level of artistic responsibility to the medium itself and to the culture. Studios, theaters, etc. should work to keep space for other types of films for the good of the culture itself. And I mean, unless your Ayn Rand herself come back to argue otherwise from a purely market-driven standpoint, philosophically, I see very little to argue there, but... Then comes the second point. I have no interest in the cinema, not cinema thing because it's a stupid fight, just like the high art, low art thing. Art is art, cinema is cinema, cuisine is cuisine, stop trying to avoid engaging critically with parts of a medium you don't think are worth your time by arbitrarily declaring that they aren't really part of the medium. It's childish, it's pointless, so is play acting some kind of meaningful distinction between singular visionary auteur filmmaking and assembly line corporate filmmaking, which at this point is starting to sound a little bit too similar to disco sucks rock DJs in the late 70s going on about real musicians versus studio-created sound, and we remember how that nonsense ended, so please cut the bullshit. But apart from that, I really don't give a shit whether Scorsese or anyone else likes this movie or dislikes that genre in this discussion, because it shouldn't matter in this discussion, and acting like it should matter screws the whole thing up. If things like one genre crowding out theaters, or one studio using block booking to over-represent their presence on screen, or the general Disney Monopoly concept are as bad as they supposedly are, then they have to be equally bad regardless of what the content actually is. That's not to say that one can't sympathize with a filmmaker whose great films often had to get affirmed as such after beat out for Best Picture by both Rocky and Dances with Wolves, and who's now opening his new masterpiece mainly on Netflix when it comes to resenting the blockbuster scene, and to be honest, it's not hard to wonder how long he's been bottling his resentment up and sees the MCU as a target where he can finally vent on the subject without having to worry about the awkwardness of calling out friends and colleagues like Spielberg and Lucas as he would have had to do in the 90s or 80s, but making this a discussion about the worthiness or lack thereof of the kind of films oversaturating the business side of things carries with it the implication that all of the bad market practices and monopolistic tendencies would become okay if Disney and Marvel were simply in the business of making the kinds of films Martin Scorsese and others like him preferred instead. Now, I don't think that's the point Martin Scorsese's trying to make. I certainly don't think it's what he believes. So why is it the thing that we've all been stuck arguing about? I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.